Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you. So today I'm going to discuss a view called sentientism that has gotten a lot of play in the ethics of consciousness. Uh, so I'm going to explain the view, some reasons for it, some challenges for it, some challenges for rejecting the view, and I want to propose a framework given how important some of the practical issues in consciousness science is, what is an ecumenical way we can hold debates over the ethics of consciousness. So sentientism in the weak form I'm going to be discussing today is just a simple view that there's something particularly normatively significant about phenomenal consciousness. So sentience, which is just the capacity to enter phenomenal states, that makes you a more important creature for having that ability. Phenomenal states have some importance uh, relative to neighboring states, which are similar but don't have the phenomenal aspect. So we can distinguish sentientism from a couple similar views. One would be strong sentientism, which would be about uh, phenomenal consciousness being a requisite for value or moral status. So I'm not going quite that far, at least today, though you can see Albert Einstein, I won't butcher the German, but he said if it wasn't for this inner light, the world would be nothing but a Haufen Scheiße. So uh, that's, I think, the quintessential expression of strong sentientism. Uh, and it will be lurking in the background, I think, a little bit. Another is quasi-sentientism, which we see coming out of the illusionist school of thought. So it's like sentientism, but we see it for quasi-sentientists, quasi-phenomenal states. This is just the disposition to report that one is in such a state, but it doesn't necessarily involve phenomenality itself. So why endorse sentientism? Uh, I found four main reasons. So one is it just seems obvious. Francois Cameron has wrote about this. So it just seems we can say without hesitation that it feels bad to feel, it's bad to feel pain, right? And we can extend this to things like, you know, what it's like to raise a child, to fall in love. These are all things that just seems obvious it has value. We saw today with the valence talks, it might be a little complicated how we come to know about that and there might be different stories, but at least it does seem that we don't hesitate to say. Another is that phenomenality is our means of empathy under a lot of theories. Uh, phenomenal uh, consciousness is implied in how we empathize with other people, and most people, uh, save for a few uh, notable philosophers, argue that empathy is fundamental moral furniture. So sentientism plays off of empathy. Another is that explains the philosophical program. We see philosophers of mind, and especially ethicists, invoking uh, consciousness and having a uh, big concentration on it. And here we see two philosophers, Christine Korsegaard and Peter Singer, obviously two very fa different figures. One's a neo-Kantian, one's a utilitarian. And they're both play sentience as an essential uh, part for either moral status or value in their ethics. And another is that it possibly explains p at least part of the scientific program. So, you know, different uh, uh, scientists of consciousness have different uh, uh, specialties and different concentrations, but it's clear that there's a lot of scientists who are very interested in the phenomenal aspect. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Bernie Bars, uh, he doesn't talk about phenomenal consciousness a lot, but if you dig deep into some of his writings, you know, he places this equivalence between access and, or some aspect of access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. So he is, even though he doesn't use the word a lot, he's often talking about it in some sense. And if you, you know, Sometimes it's hard to find the scientist actually talking about these things, but he is concerned about values, and he talks about bringing values into the science and why it's important and motivating. And uh, Victor Lama is another one, uh, another scientist who's talking about how his theory can help us adjudicate phenomenal experience being present or absent, and we can also see him waxing philosophical a little bit about his dog and whether his dog feels consciousness. So I think that uh, the sentientism can do something to explain why scientists pursue these questions so uh, forcefully. Uh, okay, so what are some challenges for sentientism? They're not always expressly made to be uh, overall challenges for sentientism. Sometimes they're conditional. So if you hold materialism, sentientism has this problem. If you hold dualism, sentientism has this uh, problem. Uh, so I'm going to focus on two or three, depending on how much time I save. And what I'm going to argue is that uh, these challenges are interesting and they help us flesh out sentientism and its commitments and some of the things it needs to work on, but none of them uh, come to a convincing refutation. And as we can see, Francois Cameron is uh, one philosopher who really wants to mount a total challenge to sentientism, not so much uh, conditional. So the first challenge is practical inadequacy. So phenomenal consciousness, as we know today, it's vexed. We've made a lot of progress in the last 25 years, but there's a lot we don't know. For instance, there's a lot of disagreements about the distribution of phenomenal consciousness, which animals have it. So this leads to a lot of practical problems. Which animals are phenomenally conscious? And this can dictate how much we care about them, right? 
So mm -hmm. uh, some uh, Francois Cameron points out, you know, we can turn to decision theory. There's a whole academic discipline built on making actions in imperfect information, right? Mm -hmm. So we can turn to that, but that is a concession. There's a problem here. And I have a somewhat optimistic and somewhat pessimistic answer to this. The first is we have reason to be optimistic is that we do see a little bit of convergence. For instance, uh, as Birch points out, there's an emerging consensus that uh, current evidence supports attributing some consciousness to mammals, birds, cephalopods. So we do see that the scientists are coming to some convergence, and usually it's a broadening of the conception of which a creature can be conscious. The second response I want to give is a little more pessimistic. It's that, look, it doesn't matter what we do. Ethics is hard. There's going to be things that we don't know, right? So let's take the preference-based approach by uh, Shevlin, uh, who spoke wonderfully yesterday. Uh, so, our, so he says, uh, under this alternative view to sentientism, it's goal-directed behavior, right, that we use to assess uh, the moral status of a creature. So uh, under this view, uh, there's still an open question. Is some of those goals morally oriented, right? Uh, and there's a big controversy, and that's, well, I don't know how big it is, but there is a present controversy about the moral capabilities of different creatures. Can we see creatures as moral agents? Could you really be a bad dog for instance. And, uh, you know, it turns, it, uh, as Shelley Kagan says, you know, if something's a moral agent, that changes its degree of agency, and even under this competing theory, uh, that could be leading to problems. So I'll move on for now. Um, I'll also skip over metaphysical vagueness for today. So another challenge, and this one is uh, contingent on materialism, but uh, they wouldn't let anyone in here who wasn't a materialist anyway, right? <laughs> so uh, this is uh, so this is uh, from weak illusionism. So this is a concept that Francois Cameron has argued for, and it's the idea that phenomenal consciousness lies to us by seeming possibly non-physical. So maybe it lies to us by when it seems valuable. When we introspect into it, phenomenal consciousness really exists, but not in the way it seems. So, Francois Cameron says that this should give us a high degree of suspicion. It shouldn't be trusted. It's like fruit from a poisonous tree, the knowledge of value we get. So, there's three potential responses, I think. So, one is that we can deny that phenomenal consciousness really seems not physical. Some philosophers have tried to argue that. We can also deny that illusion in the metaphysics of consciousness implies illusion in its normative value. So, uh, Dave Chalmers has uh, obviously famously argued that we could possibly be living in a simulation. He wouldn't construe that, that the world is an illusion, but some people would. And uh, it doesn't seem to have dangerous implications on the normative value of our lives, even if we're kind of mistaken about the fundamental aspect of the world. Similarly, if I go to hug my friend, and we know that the folk conception of physics, of touching, isn't quite real, right? This real story is something more about electrons pushing against electrons. That doesn't seem to make my hugging my friend any less important when he's having a bad day. It's just as normatively important. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the third response. And so I'm going to take stock now. A lot of these challenges are, you know, there's the practical challenge of uh, how do we deal with, how do we construct an animal ethics? That is very pressing. But a lot of the other challenges and the ones I couldn't go into today are dealing with perennial metaphysical issues. They're dealing with sorority paradoxes, with skepticism, with vagueness. And for that reason, I think that we, they can be seen more as puzzles. They're metaphysical, philosophical issues, and they're not something that we should feel gives a pressing uh, need to refute sentientism. So what are some ways that uh, we could possibly have a more convincing case? Well, we could see, find some empirical evidence. We can see increasing divergence in sentient descriptions if scientists started branching apart instead of converging. We can see that... Uh, a lot of sent, uh, creatures might be vaguely conscious. I couldn't really get into that today. And we could also see some evidence that we are systematically mistaken about the valence of conscious states, which is a lot of the research uh, we saw starting today uh, is might be implicated in. That's two minutes till Q&A or for the... Uh, the okay, all right, good. So I have enough time to go into challenges for anti-sentientism. So one, uh, as Francois Cameron has uh, thoroughly outlined, it's probably committed to some revision of ethics. It needs some sort of replacement theory. If we're not going to have sentience doing this important work in ethical theory, we need something else. And, uh, you know, there's some very sophisticated ways to meet this normative challenge, but there's also some skepticism that this is even principally possible. Uh, Caddy Balog argues that, you know, empathy and effective reaction is a big part of uh, morality, right? And, and once you abstract that away, it's really hard to reconstruct 
anything else that would be sufficient. Another is the threat of nihilism. So here we see Erwin Schrodinger, he said, if the world never did flash the light of consciousness, then it would be a play before empty benches, not existing for anybody, that's quite properly not existing. So, and then we see uh, uh, Camus. So uh, Kammerer argues that, look, nihilism is a story tradition in philosophy, but you know, we have some nihilism or nihilism adjacent philosophers who still invoke phenomenal consciousness a lot in their worldview. So it does need to be worked out if you want to go the nihilist route. What exactly was phenomenal consciousness doing for the nihilist? How are you going to restrict, uh, reconstruct that without it? Uh, so I just want to close by emphasizing how important a lot of the consciousness science we do is, and that the refutations, uh, we don't want to get too uh, polemical in this debate because let's say sentientism is false, right? And let's say the arguments against sente sentientism that is nihilistic are true, right? So then me and Francois, if we're arguing against in this way, we would be like these two missileers blowing the whole thing up, right? Because our combination of our arguments would entail a sort of nihilism. This could be a big distraction. I don't think we should underestimate the possibility of these more abstract ethical debates bearing on uh, optimism and practicality. So thank you.